A very good evening aspirants welcome to Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankara A's Academy for the day 29th of May 2022 See displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today. Before going into articles discussion, we are going to see a previous year prelims question which was asked in the year 2019, and after that we'll get into article discussion. The first article here is about a draft framework on non-personal data collection. Don't think that it is a mains related topic. You can expect any type of statement in your prelims question. See if a statement is asked like government has not taken any steps with regards to non personal data you should know that that statement is wrong we have heard so many legislation and judgments regarding personal data and privacy right so if a statement is asked like this you should not be confused you should know that government has also taken steps to collect and access non personal data also so in that way discussing about these articles will help you a lot So the first article is about the non-personal data collection and the draft framework on non-personal data. Now the second article is a science and technology related article. It is about nanobots or the tiny robots used in the bacterial infection of tooth. So using this opportunity we are going to see about nanotechnology and applications of nanotechnology in different fields. Now coming to the third article it is about the UN habitat so we are going to discuss un habitat from prelims point of view now moving on to the final article which is the indo pacific economic framework ipef see it is a us initiative in this article discussion we are going to see why us is promoting this initiative and uh, what is the significance for india with regards to ipef and after the article's discussion as usual we are going to discuss some of the prelims questions and i have given a mains question for you to practice as well so without any delay now let's get into the previous year prelims question discussion we are going to start with this previous year prelims question which was asked in the year 2019 the question says with reference to british colonial rule in india consider the following statements see after reading the question itself we know that it is a history based question to be very specific it is a modern history based question If you are someone who is an expert in modern history then it's a piece of cake for you because the statements have stated the facts in the modern history but if you are someone who is having trouble to remember modern history or if you are not a big fan of modern history then also no problem we can approach this question and arrive at an answer so that's what we are going to do here we are going to assume that you don't know anything about modern history but don't go into the examination hall without studying modern history with the confidence that you can approach the question and arrive at an answer read about it see this is for worst case scenario what if you forgot certain facts about modern history when you are in the examination hall at that time you should not panic you should have the confidence that then also you can arrive at an answer so for that only we are going to do this task here so with this note let us read the statements one by one Statement 1 Mahatma Gandhi was instrumental in the abolition of system of indentured labor See here we don't have to know whether the statement is right or not you just have to take an educated guess See if you have read about Gandhi's early movements in India we all know that everything is about farmers or workers or laborers See what is Champaran Satyagraha it is about indigo cultivators paying heavy taxes And what is Keda Satyagraha? It is about farmers not getting remission because of failed crops. And what is Ahmedabad Mill Strike? It is the hunger strike led by Mahatma Gandhi during an industrial dispute between owners and workers of the cotton mill in Ahmedabad. So from this we can safely say that Mahatma Gandhi had played a lot of role in the improvement of conditions of laborers. See indentured labor here is a slave like condition. So there is a probability of Mahatma Gandhi playing instrumental role in the abolition of system of indentured labor. So this statement has the probability of being right. See we have only found that there is a probability of this statement being right. We don't know for sure whether this statement is right or not. Let that statement be like that. Now let us move on to the second statement. In Lord Chelmsford war conference Mahatma Gandhi did not support the resolution on recruiting Indians for world war So here also you don't have to know the statement you just have to know whether Mahatma Gandhi is a moderate or extremist See moderates what did they do throughout the freedom struggle 
they appealed to the british by satisfying what they said or by fulfilling what they said they thought that if indians are well behaved british would give the government to indians so that is the belief of moderates but what did extremists do they believed in violent protests so what is the statement saying here mahatma gandhi did not support the resolution on recruiting indians for world war see this is something an extremist would do they would write out reject the demands of the british but moderates they will obviously say yes so if we find out that mahatma gandhi is a moderate there is a chance that he might have supported the resolution on recruiting indians for world war see we are just arriving at the probability of this statement being wrong we don't know anything for sure now coming to the third statement consequent upon the breaking of salt law by indian people the indian national congress was declared illegal by the colonial rulers see this statement is a typical british action right whenever they can't do anything about it they will declare an institution as illegal or declare someone as terrorist we have seen instances where so many times indians were declared terrorist ironical right and we have this one legislation which is called as the defense of india act 1915 how ironic it should be us who should be defending india from the british not the other way around right defense of india act was an emergency criminal law enacted in the year 1915 and its intention was to curtail the nationalist and revolutionary activities of the indian independence movement majorly based on gadar party so based on these incidents we can safely say that there is a probability of statement 3 being right see we are only taking an educated guess here statement 1 and 3 might be true because they have a high probability of being true or being right but statement 2 it has a high probability of being wrong so going by that is there an option where it is given as 1 and 3 as the right answer oh yes it is it's option b 1 and 3 only and it is also the right answer so like this you can make an educated guess and arrive at the answer but it has to be based on facts that you know it should not be a random guess then only you will arrive at the correct answer so that's all for this previous our prelims question and uh, go and read about modern history and brush up your facts with this note now let us move on to the articles discussion see this first article here the article mentions that government has released a draft framework to deal with the use of non personal data it is called the national data governance framework shortly ndgf and it will accelerate the steps towards a digital government and digitization of government with common standards rules and guidelines and in this way the framework is expected to catalyze india's aim of achieving 1 trillion dollar digital economy see this is the essence of the news article given here so in this context let us see few important provisions of this framework what is this framework again it is national data governance framework but before discussing the important provisions the syllabus relevant to the article is given here for your reference please go through it now let us start our discussion see we are living in a world that uses internet every day especially internet of things and artificial intelligence has become a part of our lives see most of the houses nowadays have alexa and other artificial intelligence devices right and this mandates the digitization of not only the economy but also the government and the governance see india has already started the digitization but such digitization also generates an exponentially increasing volume of data to enhance the access to that data and to enhance its quality and increase its use along with its management is one of the purposes of this framework which is the ndgf that is the national data governance framework so what is the purpose of this framework to access the data to enhance the quality to increase the use of that data and to manage it see it will be done in line with the current and emerging technology needs of the decade in this manner the framework aims to realize the full potential of digital government which will be done by maximizing the data led governance and catalyzing data based innovation that can transform government services and their delivery to the citizens see focus areas will be those of social importance like agriculture healthcare law and justice education etc why these areas are of social importance because these areas are crucial for the human development 
So these will be the focus areas. But to access, use and manage data, first of all, a data set is needed. So the framework launches non-personal data based India data sets program. So this India data sets program is based on non-personal data. It also addresses the methods and rules to ensure that the non-personal data and the anonymized data from both the government and private entities are safely accessible by research and innovation ecosystem. Remember this line again, this framework is all about ensuring non-personal data and anonymized data from both of the government and private entities being safely accessed by research and innovation ecosystem. See, we are using this term non-personal data a lot of times. So what is this non-personal data? When the data is not personal data, it is a non-personal data. So what includes personal data? Data pertaining to the characteristics traits or attributes of identity which can be used to identify an individual or called as personal data. For example, the name of a person, their address including IP address comes under personal data. So when the data is without any personally identifiable information, it is considered as non-personal data. Therefore, such non-personal data includes data that can never be related to an identified person or identifiable natural person. For example, data on weather conditions, data from sensors installed on industrial machines, etc. Now apart from this, it also includes the data which are initially personal data. But later, they were made anonymous. See, it is made anonymous by applying data transformation techniques to the extent that individual specific events are no longer identifiable. It means that it cannot be traced back to an individual. So, this process is called anonymization of data and the end result is called anonymized data. If you remember correctly, in the month of February, we discussed a draft policy called Draft India Data Accessibility and Use Policy 2022. But this policy was widely criticized. So now in its place, this NDGF, that is the National Data Governance Framework, draft has been prepared. The draft has laid out certain objectives of the policy, which I have given here. Just go through it and capture the essence of the objectives. If these objectives are given in a statement in your prelims question, you will be able to identify that these are the objectives of NDGF. You don't have to memorize it, just get the essence of it. Now along with this, the policy also provides for the setting up of an institution called India Data Management Office, that is the IDMO. IDMO will be set up under the Digital India Corporation, which functions under the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. And it is very obvious, right? See, digital data comes under electronics and information technology. So, it is obvious that it is managed by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. See, IDMO has been envisaged of having a multifaceted role. Now, let us see what they are. First of all, it will be responsible for framing, managing and periodically reviewing and revising the NDGF policy. Secondly, it will be responsible for developing rules, standards, guidelines under this policy and this will be done in consultation with the ministries, state governments and industry. See, this includes formulating all data, data sets, metadata rules, standards and guidelines relating to data storage and retention, government to government data access, India data sets program, identification of data sets, data anonymization. This we saw just now, right? What is data anonymization? making the data anonymized so that it cannot be traced back to a person. Nextly, data quality and metadata standards, data sets access platforms, data sets access and availability, limits to data request. So basically, everything that is done with data comes under the responsibility of this institution called IDMO. Now apart from this, IDMO will design and manage the India data sets platform. This platform will process the request and provide access to the non-personal data sets and anonymized data sets to the Indian researchers and startups. So this India data sets platform will only process the request and provide access to the non-personal data and this India data sets program will be designed and managed by the institution IDMO. Further, 
IDMO will accelerate the inclusion of non-personal data sets housed with ministries and private companies into the India data sets program. See, government, they have their own set of data and private companies, they have their own set of data. So, what is this institution doing? IDMO will accelerate the inclusion of non-personal data sets from both the ministries and the private companies into the common program which is the India data sets program so that it can be accessed by the researchers and startups. And finally, it will encourage and foster the data and AI based research startup ecosystems by working with the Digital India Startup Hub. See, along with the IDMO, data management units is to be set up in every ministry or department. This data management units are shortly referred as DMU and DMU will be headed by a designated chief data officer. And this data management units, they will work closely with the institution IDMO for ensuring the implementation of the policy. So, IDMO along with the data management units, they are responsible for the implementation of the policy. And with this, we have come to the end of the discussion. Now, we'll have a quick recap. In this discussion, we saw that digitization is inevitable. Internet of things and artificial intelligence has become a part of our lives. So, this creates the need for digitization of not only the economy but also the government and governance. In this line, government has released a draft framework to deal with the use of non-personal data and we saw that framework as the National Data Governance Framework. So, what is the purpose of this NDGF? To enhance access to the data, to enhance the quality of data, increase the use of data along with its management. So, after seeing that, we saw what is personal data, what is non-personal data. See, a data which is not personal data is a non-personal data. It is as simple as that. Data which contains characteristic traits and attributes of identity which can be used to identify an individual or categorize just personal data. We saw examples for that. It includes name of a person, their address including IP address. And after that, we saw non-personal data and this data can never be related to an identified person. For example, data on weather conditions and data from sensors on industrial machines. See, non-personal data also includes data which were made anonymous. So, initially it was a personal data and after that it is made anonymous and the process is called anonymization of data and the result is called anonymized data. So, non-personal data includes two types of data. One is data which can never be traced back to a person. The other category is personal data which were made anonymous. And after that we saw this framework comes as a replacement for draft India Data Accessibility and Use Policy 2022. Why is this policy replaced? This is because the draft India Data Accessibility and Use Policy has been widely criticized. So, in that place, now NDGF draft is prepared. And after that, we moved on to see some of the objectives of NDGF and an institution called India Data Management Office. And we saw the multifaceted role played by the institution, which includes framing, managing, reviewing, revising the policy and developing rules, standards, guidelines. And after that, designing and managing the India data sets platform. And this platform only processes the request and provide access to the non-personal data. And also we saw that the institution will accelerate the inclusion of non-personal data from ministries and private companies into the India Datasets program. And finally, it will encourage and foster the data and AI based research. And we ended our discussion by seeing data management units. See, these units are very important because DMU will closely work with the IDMO and they both ensure the implementation of the policy. And now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Look at this news article here. See, this news article talks about another application of nanotechnology. The article says that nanobots, which is nothing but tiny robots, which are not more than 300 nanometers, can be used to perform root canal treatment. See, the bot's movement can be controlled using a device that generates a low intensity magnetic field. And scientists injected these nanobots into the extracted tooth samples and tracked their movement via microscope. By manipulating the frequency of the magnetic field, these nanobots could be used to move at will and penetrate deep inside the 
dentinal tubules and after doing this the dentist can control the movement of billions of nanobots and take them to the site of the bacterial infection and working in tandem these nanobots can generate enough heat to kill the bacteria and also it will not damage the surrounding healthy tissue and this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us discuss about nanotechnology and its applications see science and technology related topics are always useful when it comes to prelims and as well as in mains so pay close attention to this discussion now let us see what is nanotechnology see nanotechnology is the development and use of techniques to study the physical phenomena and develop new devices and material structures in the physical size of range between 1 to 100 nanometers see in simple words it's nothing but devices or structures in the physical size of range 1 to 100 nanometers see nanotechnology impacts all areas of our lives and these include materials and manufacturing electronics computers telecommunication and information technologies medicine and health the environment and energy storage chemical and biological technologies and even agriculture now let us see some of the fields in which nanotechnology is used see in everyday life using nanotechnology materials can effectively be made stronger lighter more durable and more reactive so what does this mean it means that nanotechnology can be used to alter the physical properties of materials see for example we can use clear nanoscale films on eye glasses computer camera displays and car glasses this will make them water and residue repellent anti reflective self cleaning resistant to ultraviolet or infrared light and scratch resistant etc see this is how the physical properties are altered see light weighting of cars trucks airplanes boats and spacecraft using nanotechnology or the nanomaterials could lead to significant fuel savings and this is one application now moving to the field of electronics nanotechnology has greatly contributed in faster smaller and more portable systems that can manage and store larger and larger amounts of information see flexible foldable rollable stretchable electronics are reaching into various sectors and they are being integrated into variety of products including wearables like smart watches on internet of things and this is the application in the field of electronics now coming to the medical field nano medicine applies the knowledge and tools of nanotechnology to produce precise solutions for disease prevention diagnosis and treatment see nanotechnology here is used in all these categories which is prevention diagnosis and treatment See commercial applications have adapted gold nanoparticles for the detection of targeted sequences of nucleic acid and this is diagnosis and apart from this gold nanoparticles are also being clinically investigated as potential treatments for cancer and other diseases also and this is treatment like we saw nanotechnology is being used in diagnosis and treatment as well and this is in the medical field now coming to the energy sector nanotechnology is improving the efficiency of fuel production from raw petroleum materials through better catalysis it also helps in reduced fuel consumption in vehicles and power plants through higher efficiency combustion and decreased friction see researchers are developing wires containing carbon nanotubes that will have much lower resistance than the high tension wires which is currently used in the electric grid and what does this do this will help in reducing transmission power loss and that's all regarding this news article now let us have a quick recap in this discussion we saw about nanotechnology which is the development and use of techniques to develop new devices or structures in the physical range between 1 to 100 nanometers and we saw that nanotechnology impacts all areas in our life such as material manufacturing electronics computers telecommunication information technology medicine health environment energy storage chemical and biological techniques and even agriculture and after that we moved on to see some of the applications in different fields first of all we saw that nanotechnology can be used to alter the physical properties of materials and after that we saw nanotechnology can be used to make the systems that is the electronic systems faster smaller and more portable 
and we moved on to see the application in the medical field we saw that nanotechnology can be used to produce solutions for disease prevention diagnosis and treatment we saw the example of gold nanoparticles here which is used for the detection of nucleic acid and it is being investigated as potential treatment for cancer and other diseases and finally we saw the application in the energy sector which includes efficient fuel production reduced fuel consumption and use of carbon nanotubes in wires that will have much lower resistance than the high tension wires used in the electric grid and this will lead to reduction in transmission power loss and with these points in mind now let us move on to the next article discussion look at this next article here This news article states that UN Habitat has identified multi-hazard vulnerabilities, urban sprawl, weak urban mobility, and green-blue disconnect as the pressing issues for Jaipur city. So, in this context, let us discuss about UN Habitat from prelims point of view, and we'll also discuss the important points mentioned in the article. But before that, we are going to see what is the meaning of the terms we just saw. See what is this urban sprawl? It is nothing but rapid expansion of the geographic extent of cities and towns. So why is this happening? This is because of the increased population in the urban areas. Since the population is growing, the geographic area of the cities and towns are also expanding, and this condition is called as urban sprawl. And what is this weak urban mobility? This is nothing but low availability of transportation. That is less number of low frequency of public transportation. Example: buses, trains, metros, etc. Now, what is this green blue disconnect? See, green refers to nature, tree cover, forest cover, and blue refers to the water bodies. So, from the name itself, we can easily find out that this green blue disconnect is nothing but the urban areas being disconnected from the tree cover and being disconnected from the water bodies. So, these are identified as the pressing issues for Jaipur city. See, you may think that uh, these issues are concerned with Jaipur city. Why do we have to know about these terms? See, these terms will help you enrich your mains answer. I'll tell you how. Let us assume that a question is being asked about urbanization and the impacts of urbanization or about the consequences of increasing population. You can mention all these terms that we discussed now in your answer and these terms will give you an edge because these are all keywords. See urban sprawl, weak urban mobility, green blue disconnect. These keywords will definitely fetch you more marks for your answer. And not just for mains, it will be useful for your prelims also let us say a question is asked about the consequences of urbanization or the consequences of growing population and if these terms are given in the statements you will easily find out that these are all the consequences of growing population or urbanization so whenever you come across a term like this or any term or keywords know the meaning of it it will be useful for you and with that note now let us move on to see about the un habitat See the United Nations Human Settlements Program that is the UN Habitat is the United Nations Agency for Human Settlements and Sustainable Urban Development. It was established in the year 1978 as an outcome of the first UN Conference on Human Settlements and Sustainable Urban Development which is called as the Habitat 1. It was held in Vancouver, Canada in the year 1976. So the conference was held in the year 1976 but UN Habitat was established in the year 1978 and know that UN Habitat maintains its headquarters at the United Nations office at Nairobi Kenya it is mandated by the United Nations General Assembly to promote socially and environmentally sustainable towns and cities with the goal of providing adequate shelter for all this is the vision and kindly note that It is also a member of United Nations Development Group. So UN Habitat is a member of UN Development Group. Now apart from this, the mandate of the UN Habitat derives from the Habitat Agenda. So this Habitat Agenda is adopted by United Nations Conference on Human Settlements, which is known as the Habitat 2. We saw Habitat One, right? It was held in the year nineteen seventy six. But this Habitat Two, it was held in Istanbul, Turkey, in nineteen ninety six. 
The first one was held in Vancouver, Canada in the year 1976, but Habitat 2 was held in Istanbul, Turkey in 1996 which was after 20 years of Habitat 1. So in this conference only habitat agenda was adopted now the twin goals of habitat agenda are adequate shelter for all and the development of sustainable human settlements in the urbanizing world so these are all facts here habitat 1 was held in vancouver canada 1976 habitat 2 was held in istanbul turkey 1996 In Habitat 2, Habitat Agenda was adopted. The twin goals of Habitat Agenda are adequate shelter for all, development of sustainable human settlements in an urbanizing world. Now, apart from this, you should know that the Governing Council of the UN Habitat is the intergovernmental decision-making body of the program. See, the UN Habitat works with partners to build inclusive, safe, resilient, sustainable cities and communities. and un habitat also promotes urbanization as a positive transformative force for people and communities and it helps in reducing inequality discrimination and poverty see we know that sustainable development goals necessitate people centered planning to achieve goal 11 which is sustainable cities and communities in this regard un habitat is mandated by the unga to promote socially and environmentally sustainable towns and cities and communities un habitat has been at the forefront of supporting countries to have access to reliable data and information on urban conditions and trends now that's all about the un habitat now coming back to the article un habitat city coordinator ankit gupta told that they have identified a few critical issues related to jaipur's urban development So mitigating urban sprawl is a major challenge. So he recommended redevelopment and redensification of the existing urban areas and this will prevent the geographical extension of cities that is nothing but the urban sprawl. He also said that the city had weak access to a public transportation system with less number of buses and poor road delineation. and to address this he said that fair integration for different modes of transport would make the movement convenient and it will also reduce the traffic on vehicle emissions he also said that non motorized transport infrastructure should also be strengthened in the city and apart from this in order to increase the green cover and promote biodiversity eco trails have been proposed across the city plantation along the natural drainage channels and railway tracks were also recommended now that's all regarding this news article now let's have a quick recap in this discussion we saw the meaning of some of the terms urban sprawl is the geographic extension or expansion of cities and towns weak urban mobility is nothing but low frequency or inaccessibility to public transportation blue green disconnect is nothing but being disconnected from the environment that is tree cover and water bodies and after that we saw about the united nations human settlements program which is nothing but the un habitat see both are same only you should not be confused between these two so un habitat is a united nations agency for human settlements and sustainable urban development it was established in the year 1978 and it is an outcome of the first un conference on human settlements and sustainable urban development it is called as habitat 1 it was held in vancouver canada 1976 now the second conference was held in istanbul turkey 1996 it was called as habitat 2 and habitat agenda was adopted by this conference the agenda has twin goals one is adequate shelter for all the other one is development of sustainable human settlements in an urbanizing world and we saw some of the objectives of un habitat which is to build inclusive safe resilient sustainable cities and communities and to promote urbanization as a positive transformative force and to promote socially and environmentally sustainable towns and cities and we saw a fact here which is about the sustainable development goals related to sustainable cities and communities and what is that goal goal number 11 and finally we ended our discussion by seeing some of the measures to address the issues faced by jaipur city for mitigating urban sprawl it is recommended to redevelop and redensify the existing urban areas and to address weak access to a public transportation system fair integration for different modes of transport is recommended 
and it is also recommended to strengthen the non motorized transport infrastructure and to address the green blue disconnect eco trails are proposed across the city and plantation along natural drainage channels and railway tracks were also recommended see these are all golden points you can use these measures exactly as they are in your answers so please take note of these points and use it in your mains answer and with this note now let us move on to the next article discussion see this last article here it is an faq article see us president joseph biden's new trade initiative for the region indo pacific economic framework for prosperity was launched this week and it was witnessed by leaders of 13 countries including india's prime minister narendra modi see it is seen as the start of a new economic block in the region and it is seen as a counter to china see the ipef which is the indo pacific economic framework for prosperity comprises a baker's dozen of australia brunei india indonesia japan republic of korea malaysia new zealand the philippines singapore thailand the united states and vietnam and it represents 40 percentage of world's gdp see in this article discussion we are not going to discuss in detail about the ipef if you want to know more about it watch hindu news analysis of the date may 23rd see this article discussion is going to be more about why us is promoting such an initiative and how india is going to benefit from this initiative But before that let us see the four pillars of the IPEF framework see the IPEF framework rests on connected economy resilient economy clean economy and fair economy see connected economy includes setting standards on digital trade cross border data flows and data localization and the resilient economy is concerned with the supply chain commitments and guarding against the price spikes that is the price increase Now the clean economy it is concerned with the commitments on clean energy decarbonization and infrastructures to cut the emissions now finally the fair economy it is in terms of enforcing the regimes that cut down on money laundering and corruption and they ensure fair taxation so as a result the framework is more about standard setting and facilitating trade and it will not involve more market access for its members such as lowering the tariff barriers so that's it about the four pillars of the ipef now why us is promoting this see ipef is a part of the us pivot to asia program it includes reimagining the indo pacific as a geographic construct including america See the quad consisting of India, Australia, Japan and the US is a part of the same program which is the pivot to India program. And the IPEF is also a way for the US to keep its foot on trade in Asia. But why do they have to do this? This is because Trump administration walked out of the 11 member comprehensive progressive statement for Trans-Pacific Partnership and they walked out of it in the year 2017. and the crucial fact here is that china has applied to be a member of this agreement and there is also this other reason see the us is not a part of other big trade bloc which is the regional comprehensive economic partnership but the rcep it includes china all the members of the asean as well as australia japan new zealand and south korea and also remember that it is also a deal india walked out of in the year 2019 So by announcing a new arrangement that includes India and 7 of the 10 ASEAN members and a majority of the RCEP members the Biden administration is seeking to signal that it has not been cut out of trade in the Indo-Pacific region so this is the major reason for promoting such initiative and finally the IPEF is part of the Biden's administration's way of showing that despite its current focus on the war in Europe and the hot pursuit of russia through economic sanctions it has not lost sight that asia and the challenge from china is prominent in the us agenda so 
these are the reasons why us is promoting this ipef now what is the significance for india from this initiative see modi government too walked out of the rcep after 8 years of negotiations so the membership of the ipef keeps india in the room on asian trade agreements and apart from this the ipef's non specific and flexible nature suits india this is because india has held a strong views on a range of issues like labor standards environmental restrictions on fossil fuels and data localization so the flexible ipef suits india and moreover india's inclusion fulfills the geopolitical need to counter china's virtual control over asian trade and finally it is significant that india is the only country in south asia which has been invited to the grouping So having said that now let us come to the golden question how has china responded to this initiative that is the ipef initiative see clearly china has been deeply critical of all the us initiatives in the region and it is critical of all the us initiatives which is a part of strategy to contain china see the chinese government has accused the us of building an asian nato in the quad and the chinese government has accused the us of nuclearizing the region through the australia uk us security pact which is shortly called as aukus and now also china has accused that us proposed this initiative only to serve its own interest and additionally know that three members of the asean which were seen closest to china have not joined the ipef and these countries include myanmar cambodia and laos that's why we saw seven of the 10 asean members were in the ipef grouping so these three countries they have chosen not to join the ipef so that's all about the analysis of the ipef initiative let's have a quick recap we saw that IPEF is a new economic block in the Indo-Pacific region and it includes 13 countries namely Australia, Brunei, India, Indonesia, Japan, Republic of Korea, Malaysia, New Zealand, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, the United States and Vietnam. And after that we saw four pillars of IPEF which includes connected economy, resilient economy, clean economy and fair economy. And after that we moved on to see the reasons for The United States promoting this initiative. See, US is promoting this initiative as a part of Pivot to Asia program. One another initiative is Quad, and it is also promoting this initiative because Trump administration has walked out of comprehensive and progressive agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, and it is also not a part of regional comprehensive economic partnership. So, from this, Biden administration is seeking to signal that it has not been cut out of the trade in the region. and the united states also wanted to show that asia and the challenge from china is still prominent in the us agenda and these are all the reasons why us is promoting this ipef and after that we saw the significance for india from this initiative see india is also not a part of rcep so membership of ipef keeps india engaged with the asian trading arrangements and the ipef's non specific and flexible nature suits india and it fulfills the geopolitical need to counter china's virtual control over asian trade and finally we ended our discussion by seeing the response of china to the ipef see china has accused all of the us initiatives it has accused us of building an asian nato in the quad and it has accused us of nuclearizing the region through aukus which is a security pact between australia uk and us now with these points in mind let us move on to the next part of the discussion that is the practice prelims question discussion See today we have three prelims questions I'll solve two of them and one of them is a quiz question for you Now let us take this first question consider the following statements when a data is not a personal data or is without any personally identifiable information it is considered as non personal data Think about it for a second this we saw in our discussion itself right The statement is correct when a data is not a personal data it is called as non personal data and if it is without any personally identifiable information then also it is called as non personal data so the statement one is correct second statement says that anonymized personal data is also a non personal data 
See anonymization it allows data to be shared at the same time it allows preserving privacy see the process of anonymizing data requires that both direct identifiers like names and indirect identifiers like age or occupation are changed in some way see changed in the sense it is being removed or substituted distorted generalized or aggregated so through this it becomes a non personal data but still it bears the risk of de anonymization so from this we know that anonymized personal data is also a non personal data so the statement 2 here is also right what is the correct answer then it is option c both 1 and 2 now coming to the second question at the present level of technology which of the following activities can be successfully carried out by using nanotechnology statement 1 targeted drug delivery statement 2 reducing transmission power loss statement 3 flexible foldable and stretchable electronics statement 4 light weighting of cars trucks airplanes boats and spacecraft see all of these we saw in our discussion itself so from that you can easily say that all of the statements given here are correct so the correct option here is option d 1 2 3 and 4 See there are n number of applications with regards to nanotechnology. If you get a chance to read about it, read it. You can always get a statement regarding applications of nanotechnology in your prelims. As I said already, science and technology is very important when it comes to prelims. Now moving on to the final question which is a quiz question for you with reference to you and habitat, which one of the following statements is not correct? Read the question again. You have to identify the incorrect statement. Option A it was established in the year 1978 as an outcome of the first UN conference on human settlements and sustainable urban development held in Vancouver Canada Option B it is the member of the United Nations Development Group Option C headquarters of UN Habitat is in Geneva Switzerland and Option D UN Habitat is mandated by UNGA to promote socially and environmentally sustainable towns and cities read the question carefully try to recall the discussion that we had it is a very easy question try to attempt this question and post your answer in the comment section and i have given a mains question here for your practice so interested aspirants write it and post it in the comment section if you have any queries related to the articles that we discussed today post that also in the comment section and with this we have come to the end if you find the video useful like share and comment and do subscribe to Shankar Ayes Academy's YouTube channel. Thank you.